Hi everybody, we have a nice long show today, so I want to be... What happened? You said it was a long show. I wanted to hurry up so we can do other stuff. I didn't say that I wanted the lights to go off. Oh, sorry. I'll turn them on. Thank you. Um... We have a huge show. I'm interviewing my buddy Matt Craig. He's an actor, writer, producer, and improviser, and he's a really nice guy. And I think everybody will love this interview, especially... Now what? That wasn't me. Did you pay the bill? Roll to the credits. We've come a long, long way. Not afraid any longer. We've come a long, long way. Our love is getting stronger. We've come a long, long way. And the future's looking brighter. I have been trying to get this guest on for about a year since the inception of this show. Let me give you a little bit of feedback. When I think of the name Matt Williams, I think of the greatest baseball player that ever played in my opinion. He was born in Bishop, California, drafted by UNLV, became the third pick overall in the 1986 draft by the San Francisco Giants. And he had a very successful career with the Giants, Cleveland Indians, and Arizona Diamondbacks. He was a multi-time All-Star and a multi-time Golden Glove winner. What he might be most known for, 25 years ago this year, he was on pace to hit 62 home runs. Unfortunately, in 1994, the season was shortened because of the strike, so he only accomplished 40. When asked about it, he said that he was upset about the fact that the Giants in the world didn't win the World Series. It wasn't that he didn't hit the 60-second home run. It was that kind of attitude that made him such a known as a team player. A great spokesperson for the game of baseball and a positive force in baseball altogether. When I think of the name Matthew William Craig, I think of something very similar. A guy who is very, very positive, very, very happy, and a very much a team player and has always been a great guy. I have known him for over 10 years. He's one of my best friends. I'm proud to introduce you, Matt Craig. Hey, Matt. Hello, how are you? Fine, Thank how you. you doing? Good, very good, thanks. Good. As we finish our meal here, I wanted to um, first start by saying that you were born in, in Dayton? That's correct, Dayton, Ohio. <laughs> because of the recent tragedy, is all your family safe? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that whole incident is pretty shocking and pretty heartbreaking, but nobody, none of my direct family members, although okay. I do know a handful of people who live and work down in that area, and um, man, it's just high time we do something about Yes, I just wanted that situation. to. Yeah, but exactly. yeah, everybody is, is healthy and well. You have worn many hats in your career. What am I forgetting here? Writer, actor, producer, um, instructor, improviser, Voiceover artist. But that's pretty much it. Yeah, it's. I always say I uh, jack of all trades, master of none. But I do a lot of different things, and I jump around. And my background is from improvisation, where most of it is that you kind of multitask. When did you decide that you wanted to become an entertainer, as such? Oh man, I think it probably goes back to um, you know. Yeah, elementary school school days basically I think there was always kind of a moment where I was trying um, where I realized that I enjoyed making people laugh and I had a natural proclivity for it so um, you know I know when I was a kid I watched TV and I knew that at one point that I really wanted to try and get involved on a show like SNL or do something like that and um, so I think I always had it but I also I also wanted for a long time to be a vet and then I wanted to be a doctor and it, so it wasn't really until I got when I was in college I was a double major in, in biology and chemistry and it was really burned out because um, I was trying to be to go the route of the medical profession and I got so burned out that I was like I need to do something that is enjoyable and that choice ended up being uh, improv and, and acapella and stand-up and so it was in college I suppose that I just kind of veered off the path and was like I'm gonna do this for a couple of years just to kind of like get some sanity back in my life and then I never I never went back to the other path. Well going back to your early days 
Were you a class clown? Did you like the attention? I did. I, um, I was not a class clown, but I knew at the time that it bothered me <laughs> that I wasn't. Yeah. I think I was nominated nicest male. Yeah, most congenial. Yeah. And um, but yeah, uh, I, I did. I used to joke around a lot, and and um, and still do, obviously. Right. And uh, and I always enjoyed it. I liked, uh, and I still, you know, I, I think that that's what makes me or has made me a good. Um, improvisers, okay. quick, quick working mind. You attended Oakwood High School. That is true. Yep. Um, that is a suburb of Dayton, actually. Did you participate in athletics there, or did you do? I did for a while, and then I had Osgood Slaughters, which is a or Slaughters, I think, is actually how it's pronounced. Where you're, I had a growth spurt. Basically, your your bones grow so fast that your tendons don't keep up, so they pull off the bone. Yeah. So when you do quick starts, like you do with your nose guard, which is what I was a nose guard okay. in the center. You blow, you blow your knees out. And so because of that, I ended up getting involved in the drama club. Did you have good grades growing in that? And the Oakwood High School is a very competitive school. And yeah, I think I graduated with right around like a 3.9 or something like that. But I was what? still like ninth in my class because there was uh, advanced placement courses that allowed people. So there were a handful of people that graduated from my high school with a 4.0. Plus. Wow. So I was a dummy compared to some other people in my class. As you mentioned, you went to college. You actually went to Washington in St. Louis. Yeah, Washington University. And you said your majors were biology, biology and chemistry, although by my junior year, I dropped the chemistry and started to pursue drama. And so I ended up graduating with a biology degree and a theater minor. At that point, you entered something called Mama's Pot Roast. Mama's Pot Roast was an improv group <clears throat> that had actually started the year before I joined it. Uh, so the first full year of its existence, I was the first one of the first people, myself and this wonderfully talented woman named Danny Cher were the first two people that actually auditioned and joined that group. Um, but the guy that I replaced was Peter Sarsgaard. <laughs> He's gone on to have a very incredible career and is an incredible actor. Yeah. And, um, but Mama's Potters has a lot to do with who I am because it, that was the group that I joined, like I said, when I was burned out. And um, just some amazing, incredibly talented, gifted people. You know, improv is so huge and popular now, but back then it was just not as, as uh, notable as it is now. It wasn't something that was a part of a curriculum prior to high school. And so... That was like my, kind of, I learned about short form improv from that, so then it, from there it bridged out. There was a college comedy festival at Skidmore in upstate New York, which was the first time that I saw long form improv. So that year was really kind of a yeah, instrumental right. year of me being like, I'm really confused, and then I had a natural proclivity for improv, and I really liked the idea of doing all of that on your feet. I mean, basically improv is writing, directing, blocking, you're doing everything on your own. So I loved it, and, and that moment and that group had a lot to do with it. I also, at the, that same year, auditioned for a all-men's a cappella group. The Pikers was the all-men's a cappella group, and I got in that group as well. After college, you seemed to move around a little bit. You went to Chicago, then you went to Minnesota, then you went to Chicago. I uh, went to Chicago for three years, from 95 to 98, where I studied and did improv and did all that. I went to uh, I.O. Chicago, which was Improv Olympic at the time, and Second City in a theater called Annoyance, and auditioned for a Disney cruise line because they, at the time Disney was getting rid of their big red boat, they needed to do something with the area that used to be the casino on, on the ship, so they didn't want to have a casino on, on a Disney-based ship. So they turned it to adult-themed entertainment section. And, so I auditioned for a theater called Brave New Workshop, which is based out of Minneapolis, and that theater ran the improv stuff that was happening on the cruise ship, and I ended up taking that. It was a pretty great gig, although it was pretty it was a pretty tense gig. It was four to five short-form improv shows a night, six nights a week. So I'm sorry, how many? Four to five. At least that initial year. I think eventually they ended up replacing it with dueling pianos or something else. But it was pretty. It was a pretty grueling schedule because it literally was. Um, you had your days basically free, but there were shows at like seven, eight, nine, you know, and staggered seven, seven thirty, eight, nine, ten. 
so, so just move them in, entertain, move them out, kind yeah. of conveyor belt almost. Yes. So then I worked on that cruise ship for about six months, and then from that cruise ship got hired to become a resident company member for the Brave New Workshop, which Ooh, is wow. based out of the Twin Cities. And then it was a trade-off between these two cities. Basically, I was on the resident company for a while. They saw me in a resident. Uh, Second City came up and saw me in a resident company show in, in Brave New Workshop, and they hired me to tour for them. So I went back down to Chicago, and I toured for two years. And then the Brave New Workshop uh, was struggling a little bit with some finances, and they were going down to a two-person show, and so I went back up there to do a two-person show with a gentleman named Caleb McEwen. And that's the show that they saw me in that brought them down, and I got hired for the ETC, which is a resident company theater of Chicago. You had the opportunity to study with the master, Del Close, while over in Chicago. Yeah. You told me that he seemed um, rough and grouchy at times. Yeah. Do you remember any happy memories with him? Just by the time that I studied with Dell, he was pretty late in life. He um, And he was pretty steadfast in what he wanted, and he knew kind of what he was trying to impart upon people, but he also probably was um, kind of past his... Acceptance of other people. Well, yeah, a little bit. He was just kind of done trying to be good at what he was doing. You know, most of my memories with him, he did have little bits of wisdom that he would impart, you know, about improv and focusing on a character and maintaining a character and doing certain things. But he also had a lot about him that, um, at the time, that, you know, one of my favorite stories to tell about him was there was a time, um, you used to be when I was studying improv at, at Improv Olympic, where he was teaching that you could smoke in the theater. So that dates it a little bit. And we were in the theater, and there was a couple of us that were at the back of the theater, a gentleman named Lance and I, and we were smoking. And he came over to us, and he like took three or four cigarettes out of Lance's pack of cigarettes, who I was also smoking out of. And he took the cigarettes while a scene was happening, and he just walked out of the back of the theater, and he never came back. <laughs> <laughs> Literally to the point that the people that were on the stage were like, or, you know, like five minutes went by. And they were like, do we keep doing this? And then we all like kind of went out the back. You know, it used to be that there was a front entrance and a back mm -hmm. entrance. We went into the alley, and he was gone, and... Never just, know what happened. Yeah, he just until the next class when he came back and he he, he didn't even I think acknowledge it. He didn't even know that it had happened. You've developed a lot of friendships during this period sure. of your time. I mean, I know you've said you met Jason Sudeikis at this time. You've met a lot of other people. Who any of these power players who have made it big? Aside from Dell and Sharna, who were my teachers, I also had Tina Fey was my teacher for a little while. Amy Poehler. And then some of the people that I came up with, have, it's not completely unheard of if you have enough people that go towards, with all the same common goal, you know, that those people are in up. So the, the Jason Sudeikis's, the John Lutz, the Pete Grosses, the Jack McBrayers, the TJ Jagodowskis. You know, now I'm at a point in my life where when I watch TV, it's almost like every single thing yeah. you see. I'm sure you're in that place too where you're like, oh, I know that person. That You know, you don't watch it the same way. Well, I watch it and I know that person's working again. Yeah. But yeah. Well, you definitely uh, had great com company and at the same time you developed a certain amount of success for yourself. How did, how did you remain humble about this? I think I've been pretty lucky in a lot of ways because I've just been able to kind of pursue the thing that I want to do. Because sometimes when I sit back, I think, man, I've been, I, you know, I was on, on the office for in a small role and I wrote for SNL and I got to produce and write over 1,500 minutes of Looney Tunes. And yeah. I think for me, it, it was a finding a healthy balance between what's really important which is friendship and family and, and those things while simultaneously understanding that I need to be creative and I need to have an outlet to do those things and I think that's part of what I learned yeah. in college which is like I need to have a balance between the two so that I don't go stir crazy which yeah. um, and I think in the, the long and the short of it that is that it's been helpful for me to recognize that it's like it's it's both of those things. For me, I want to do all these things so I can be a good mm -hmm. friend, father, son. Yeah. Uh, so that that's where I think my goal is let these things focus you in this area. Not the other way around. <laughs> around this time you met a young actress yeah. named Rebecca Sage Allen. Yeah. How did you two meet? Well, we actually met, the first time we met was, um, she was an understudy for Blue Co, which was the touring company that I was uh, on with Second City. And uh, the first time, like, we, we worked in the same community, so I knew of her, but mm -hmm. that's how we really kind of met. And in that show, I was 
had been in the, that touring company for a while, and there's a scene where we had to get married in that scene, and I sweat, like I am right now, all the time, and I remember her thinking how gross it was to have to kiss me. <laughs> and then... Um, Six months or so later, uh, as things were, she was part owner of a company called Baby Wants Candy, which is still in business today and still, um, and they go to Edinburgh, the Fringe Festival in Edinburgh, and they needed to hire some people to cover. Mm -hmm. So long story short, she ended up hiring me. She was my boss, and I ended up going to this improv festival or this theater festival in Scotland. And, um, you know, uh, we were in a awesome city doing awesome theater with a castle in the background and by the end of that trip uh, we had started dating. Speaking for Rebecca, <coughs> if you would, or even for yourself, would you consider would love at first sight for either one of you? No, I don't think so. I mean, I think it was... Um, I hope she sees this. <laughs> well, I always really liked her and I really admired her, but I think for her, I'm, I'm answering for her, I think she thought I was this kind of sweaty monster and I think a lot of it has to do with when like who you are at what point of your life mm -hmm. right for it all to click and line up and in that moment that like I think at the time she was looking for a person who had certain qualities and I think I was looking for for a woman who had certain qualities and in many ways I think that's probably uh, good because I think it al has allowed us to figure out how to adapt with one another and we have a really strong marriage and we really love each other and um, but I think a lot of that had to do with how we like kind of came together. It was kind of an understanding of like, ah, the thing that I always thought that I wanted has been right in front of me this whole time. September 30th, 2005. Yeah, that's my anniversary. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering, when you guys got married, what percentage of your audience, of your guests, were improvisers? Oh man, that's a good question. <laughs> Probably about 75%. It was a really fun wedding and, and yeah, there were a lot of fun. Um, Shenanigans. <laughs> On August 15, 2007, you and Rebecca uprooted yourselves and landed on the shores of Los Angeles. Los Feliz. Los Feliz, yes. Yeah. What um, led you to move to LA? Well, we had worked on cruise ships for a while again. Mm -hmm. So by the time that um, Rebecca and I had worked on, um, she was on the ETC stage, I was on the main stage. Uh, they had just started doing these Second City um, at Sea kind of things, these mm -hmm. big cruise ship gigs through Norwegian Cruise Line. And we had gotten married in 2005, and there was an opportunity to spend about five months in the Mediterranean, and we took it. And uh, it was incredible. We, in, in contrast to the Disney boats, the, the Second City ships, you worked, you know, at most two to three hours a week, and the rest was up to you what you did with it and um, so we traveled all over Europe and when we came back from that that particular gig we had been overseas for six months and we came back and it just happened to line up that we were back for basically the holidays leading into winter and uh, we were back in Chicago for a month or two and and I had at the time was relatively finished with what I was hoping to accomplish uh, at Second City and Rebecca I think got to that point as well and we had one of those days where it was freezing and we were like, why are we here? And so we went back <laughs> on a cruise ship and used the money. And this one went through um, the Gulf of Mexico and through the Panama Canal and wound up going up along the Pacific coast up into Alaska. And we used that money to move out to L.A. Well, you made a friend in uh, Frank Hayetti, a fellow improviser and an actor from Mad TV. Mm -hmm. And you two formed the amazing improv duo, Frank and Matt. That's right. What did you first think of Frank's style? I, I know I met him in Chicago yeah. at some point, and we toured together in Chicago. He was in Blue Co. So, okay. um, and the truth is, is that Frank and I have always had a very. Um, first off, he's just a great guy in general. He's just an incredible dude, but he's also really incredibly funny, physically. Oh, well, he's hands down one of the funniest guys I've ever met in my life, and he and I have a very complimentary style of playing, and we'd always known that. It took him moving out here when he got Mad TV and then me moving out here to kind of uh, clear the ability for us to be able to say, like, um, now we can form this two-man group. It's been going along for over a decade now. We don't perform together as consistently as we did back in the day, but we still do perform. Yeah. And, um, and it's great fun. Some of the best uh, stuff I've ever done in my career has been under the name of Franken. In 2011, you 
worked briefly for Saturday Night Live. Yeah. You even were given an Emmy nomination. <laughs> yeah. How did you get the job? For 2009, I had submitted a writing packet and had gotten hired. I had that one phone call that was like, it's going to happen, we're going to try and figure out how to move you here, blah, 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 and then like a few days later, got a phone call that was basically like, I think the gist was that Daryl Hammond was coming back, and because he was coming back unexpectedly, they didn't have the money to bring some of the people that they were bringing in, and so it fell through, and that was kind of a moment for me that I was like, I'm, I think I'm probably done, I'm, you know, if, I, if you get hired and then don't get hired, <laughs> you know. So I did not submit again, and the, the long and the short of it is is that I was performing with for Frank and Matt's show at Second City Hollywood, and Jason Sudeikis, who was at the time was on the show, stopped in Hollywood, saw that we were on the marquee, came up to see the show. Afterwards, we ended up hanging out, he and Frank and I, and uh, he, he's always been very complimentary of Frank and Matt, of us, and of me, and um, was lamenting a little bit how bummed he was that I hadn't had an opportunity to work on the show and then I think he went to bat for me because within a week or two I was hired and I was pretty lucky because at the time I was going to move in the summer and so I got hired in January of 2011 and I just worked on the second half of that season yeah. I was flying back and forth and back and forth and then Comcast bought them and I would really, really wish I had another year at that job at least so I really liked it it was a lot of fun it was really challenging did you have to do the crazy Wednesday or Thursday all-night show or all-night writing session? It's not as insane, I don't think, as it used to be. The scramble isn't as... Yeah. as and there's so many people that work on that show. At the time, you know, I think there was 20-some writers and four or five people who wrote for Weekend Update, and the performers themselves count. And so, if you really break it down, I mean, like pre-Comcast buying them, they were greenlighting like 16 or 17 sketches per week. Mm -hmm. Which, when you think, if there's like give or take 40 or 45 writers and everyone's turning in three to four sketches, yeah. you're looking at like 160 sketches and you can really only use 10% of those. So, you started on Monday, uh, you met the guest, and then you spent the next like two or three days like just cranking out scripts, cranking, cranking, cranking. And then once Wednesday hit, they were already doing selection of what the sketches were going to be. And then your time shifted a little bit. It depended on mm -hmm. whether or not you were involved in a particular sketch. And so things changed slightly. So when Comcast decided that they wanted to cut ties with certain amounts of people, how did you feel afterwards? I mean, I know you were angry and such. But well, in some ways it was kind of a relief because it had nothing to do with me. Okay. And in a lot of ways, <clears throat> when it went away, I was like, oh man, what am I going to do now? You take away SNL and there's really very limited amount of sketch, you know, improv-based <laughs> yeah. jobs out there. But um, yeah, I think I initially I was a little heartbroken just because I think it would have been, I wish I had, like I said, one more year to um, have gotten a little bit better at what it was and understood it. You know, it's like anything else. They plopped me in the middle of the season. Yeah. And I scrambled around trying to find a, you know, find out how it was all going to work. And then it, by the time that I understood it, it was ending. And then I swung for the fences for the last two months that I was there. And then I was back home. I don't remember it as being like a hor horrendously dark period. I think it was a bummer. Yeah. But then I was like, oh, I'm going to parlay this into teaching some writing classes and get back on my feet. And One of the things that you've taught me, and I think it kind of fits in right now, is that I should never play it safe. If I ever am bored with improv, then I should try to reach the character with a different perspective. I'm not sure if you remember this conversation you and I had. Yeah. Yeah, because it was very profound to me. Yeah. Do you think that that's just... I mean, it's almost like Zen math. <laughs> Do you think that that's... Uh, a way that you get over things, you look at things through different perspectives? You know, I tr I really do believe that like there, you can't control a lot of things and things happen when they're supposed to for whatever reason. And I also am a firm believer in you think that, you know, there's a philosophy out there that's like, it's called maybe, <laughs> which is like if someone says like, oh, this is a, you know, this is the worst thing that could have happened. Maybe. This is the best thing that could have happened. Maybe. Hey, it's an old Buddhist philosophy of the idea being that, like, you know, it's all perspective. It's all what you kind of hope it to be. And um, I do think I've been pretty fortunate in my life and over time in the fact that I feel like I don't get too mired in things for too long. I also don't get too connected. I do think that it's a lot about, like, adapt to the situation that you're in and find the thing in the situation that you can capitalize on. 
um, you know, it's the old story of like the water as it floats through the river, you know, mm -hmm. like it kind of glides around the obstacles, it doesn't, and I feel like that's, you know, um, my entire, like even, you know, I went to school for pre-med, I got stressed out, I got into improv, improv took me to Second City, yeah. Second City took me to SNL, SNL took me to writing, writing took me to animation, that's where I am now, yeah. and I think it'll probably keep doing this for as long as I can. Another major job you had was working on a TV show called Wabbit, which was the newest incarnation of the uh, Bugs Bunny. Yeah. And it was created by Cartoon Network. It was, yeah, it was created at Warner Brothers Animation by a guy named Eric Kuska. Uh, and he developed, a, developed the show. At the time, they were just trying to come up with a modernized version of the Looney Tunes, specifically focusing on Bugs Bunny. And it was called Wabbit for the first year, and then... Um, by the end of that first year, I went from being the story editor, which is kind of like the head writer, to the, to the producer, and then <coughs> we branched it out to all the Looney Tunes, and it was called New Looney Tunes, and we did that for, I did that for almost four and a half years. We did um, 312 five and a half minute cartoons. What's more difficult, being a voiceover artist or a writer or a producer? They're all kind of different. Voiceover is so fun. It's just, it's the closest thing I have right now um, to performing, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so it's a lot of fun. And I get to do a handful of voices and I still audition on a, on a weekly basis. So I do it every morning. <laughs> um, and it's a ton of fun. Um, but it's inconsistent. It's like yeah. anything else, you know? It's like auditioning. So you don't, there's no way to like kind of, basically, you know, when I got involved with animation was, was me kind of having a realization I got really sick, and when I got sick, I was like, I need to figure out a way to monetize this on a weekly basis. I need to figure out how to do this, which is how I got into writing animation because it is the... I live here in Burbank, and I uh, had a moment that I was like, you know, short-form comedic content. Where am I going to do that? I have all this experience now. And then it occurred to me that I'm like, that's what cartoons are. Mm -hmm. it's, and and it's, I was surrounded by it. Again, one of those things, like my wife, that I'm like, it's right there in front of you. You're so busy looking for it. So I got into animation. When I got into animation, uh, the writing of cartoons and the consistency of that is what I was pursuing. And that's where it came from. And so um, the writing is, is challenging because you have to adhere to these points of view and everything. P pr producing is really fun, but not creative. So... Um, and, and it fulfills a different side of my personality, which is I'm really OCD and I like deadlines and I like calendars. And, and it's rare to have somebody, I think, like me, who's both creative and mm -hmm. OCD, who does both things. And because of that, I've had a lot of success with it. But um, I enjoy all of them, but at times it can be a little bit well, overwhelming. Well, considering how many hours I understand that you were working, you barely saw the light of day sometimes. Yeah. yeah. As a child, were you a fan of animation? Were you a fan of cartoons? For sure. I mean, being brought in to write for Looney Tunes was like, oh yeah, everybody <laughs> knows Looney Tunes. Everybody knows Popeye. Everybody knows... And oddly enough, Warner Brothers is one of those companies that is not really... They're not creating new properties, so most of what I could work on there was Hong Kong Fui, Hanna-Barbera. So yeah, that's the stuff I grew up on. Name some animated characters that you think are reflective of you. Uh, there's a little Fred Flintstone in here, probably some Foghorn, because usually people ask you who, who my favorites are, and, and um, but this one is more on point. Huckleberry Hound. I can see that. I really can see that. Oh, there's only so much you can do, Huckleberry Hound. Uh, and then I, uh, yeah, there's a, uh, but man, I do, I like animation a lot. Yeah. How did you come across Lego? My time at Warner Brothers was coming to an end, the show had wrapped, and we were, um, I was in a development deal that, again, another company buying another company, AT&T, came in and was uh, kind of causing problems. Uh, a friend of mine had sold a show to Lego and was nervous about, um, he basically wanted some assistance and I had met him. He was a story editor on Be Cool Scooby-Doo, his name's John Colton Berry, and he called me up and he was like, hey, I need help if you have the time and inclination, and I was like, I'd be happy to spitball some ideas with you and helped him kind of like formulate kind of create the initial group of characters and what that show was going to be and then he took it off and he was running and one of the first gigs that i legitimately booked in the voiceover world once i was auditioning was for this show and so that put me back in front of him 
and he was like, hey, we're running a little bit behind. Do you want to write? And so I was already doing voices on the show, and I already helped create the show, so I kind of knew what was going on. And then so by the time the second season started, I was brought in as a story editor, and uh, the show's on Nickelodeon right now, and you can <laughs> see it on Saturday mornings, mm -hmm. and it's called Lego City Adventures. They have a brand called Lego City, which is actually their number one toy brand. And so this show is just about you know, paramedics and <laughs> firemen and police officers, and, and it's the generic version of the Lego toy itself, which is incredibly freeing because there's no agenda other than, like, make the toys look fun and have fun while you're doing it, and, and um, so it's fun. You've always been such a big kid. Yeah. So even though you are still a kid and you are of a certain age, though, what are you going to be when you grow up? Yeah, I, I think I, I just want to continue being, like I said earlier, a good dad, a good... Mm -hmm. A good dad and a good husband and a good brother and a good son and all of those things. And um, I think what you do definitely influences that, but that is my goal, okay. to be the, to be the a good all-around person. Guess what? Yeah. It's time for the trivia. All right, let's do it. These are rapid-fire questions about you known as the envelope of Matt. Okay. Okay. You attended Oakwood High School in Oakwood, Ohio. What was the name of your mascot? Lumberjacks. Uh, Douglas Shulman attended Oakwood and went on to politics. What appointed position did George W. Bush appoint him in 2008, even though he was a member of the Democratic Party? Why didn't he say he was like Attorney General? Nope. I know, I know this. I should know this. Really? Like, I know Doug Shulman. You know no Doug Shulman? Well, I know the Shulmans. I mean, okay. I went to Oakwood smaller okay. than you think, so I know the Shulmans. Man, why I should know this. Uh, uh, oh, Commissioner of the IRS. That's it. I knew it. I knew it. I should have known that one. Okay. okay. Growing up in Dayton, you were a fan of the Cincinnati Reds. In the, yes. 19, in the 1970s, the team was so powerful, they were called the Big Red Machine. Who were the members of the team that are now in the Hall of Fame? Ooh. Bench. Uh, Three more. Dusty Baker? Nope. Uh, oh, uh, Pete Rose. Yeah, he's not in it. He's not in it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Holmes. Holmes. All I can think of is Holmes. I got the. I got a later team. Sabo? Griffey? No. Uh, <laughs> um. It's actually kind of a trick question, but if you want to know the answer, right, yeah, yeah, right. Johnny Bench, no Pete Rose, obviously. Yeah. Tony Perez. Tony Perez, of course. Okay. Joe Morgan. Joe Morgan. Okay. And George Sparky Anderson. Oh. You attended Washington University in St. Louis, yeah. double majoring in biology and chemistry. That you changed later to theater. What was the original name of Washington University? Wow. That was a cartoon response. <laughs> the original name? Mm-hmm. Give you a hint. It was created in 1853. The 1853 college. No! <laughs> it was originally called the Elliott Seminary. Oh! Okay. I lived in a building called Elliott. You studied under the modern improv guru, Del Close, while living in Chicago. What was the name of the comic book series he created? Oh, God. Scientology. <laughs> it was called Wasteland. Oh, okay. That makes sense. On an episode of, according to Jim, in an episode about Gracie's first time of the month, you played Lynn. Yeah. What was your profession? A guidance counselor. Mm -hmm. Nope. Uh... PE teacher? Gracie's gym teacher. Gym teacher. You're one half of the unparalleled improv group Frank and Matt with That's a right. longtime friend Frank Coyote. Right. How many episodes of Mad TV did Frank appear on? 36. 41. You married amazing actress, improviser, mother, and earth preserver Rebecca Sage Allen. One of her first projects was she played Jeff Garland's soon-to-be ex-girlfriend in the movie I Want Someone to Eat Cheese With. What was the name of her character? Ooh, Becky? Nope. Played his, his girlfriend. Yeah. Well, she breaks up with him about 10 minutes yeah. in. Deborah? Nope. Diane. You know these questions are all about you, right? And you don't? Roberta. 
Sally. Batman. <laughs> Rebecca, you married him? Okay. <laughs> what was her name? Rebecca? Andrea Hope. Andrea. You were dad of a famous episode of The Office called A Moroccan Christmas, purchasing a princess unicorn doll from Dwight, played Rain Wilson. <laughs> What famous movie director directed that episode? Paul Feig. Yay! There you go. Feig, you get one. Yeah. You appeared in a Toyota commercial with another improvising great, Laurel Coppock. Mm -hmm. What's the name of her reoccurring character? Jan. Wow, you're getting these. I'll take it. Let's that see was you... my line in that yeah. commercial. In 2011, you were a staff writer on SNL for a handful of episodes. On the season finale, who was the guest host? Tina Fey. No. Season finale. It was either Ed Helms, Helen Mirren, Elton John. No. Tina Fey. No. Who does it say? Because I'll type. Justin Timberlake. Oh, yeah, that's right. That is right. You're because right. Lady Gaga was the music You're player. right. Yes, that is correct. That Come is on down correct. to Liquorville. Yeah. yeah. Yep, that's right. You are an ordained minister. Yeah. In 2012, on an episode of a TV show... <laughs> Called Mob. Called Mob. You married a couple through the help of a surprise flash mob. Yeah. What was the name of the couple? The first names? Uh, Andrea and James. No. Barry and Sandra. Why do I ask these questions? <laughs> I don't remember. Justin? Justin and Tina. I think, I think it was Jesse. Well, you, you were the producer on 67 episodes of Wabbit, the newest incarnation of Bugs Bunny, and also provided voices for three episodes. What was the name of the episode that you had Snoop Dogg on? Hip Hop Hair. Nice. Good. Comedian Carlos Alizarahi voiced many characters for your show. He performed in numerous commercials for a famous food chain. What was the catchphrase that he used in every commercial? Yo quiero Taco Bell. There you go. Carlos was like a lot of my favorite characters. He was Lily, Lily P. Lily Legs. He was this uh, Elliot Sampson who was like a Sam Elliott Bobcat. Carlos is uh, hire him. He's incredible. You currently work for Lego as a story editor on their upcoming animated projects. What is the plural of Lego? Lego. How did you get that? Because I work for Lego. On the dating site, Plenty of Fish in your profile, you can add to your profile AFOL. What does AFOL stand for? AFOL? Mm-hmm. Um, often fart out loud. Always fart out loud. Always fart out loud. Adult fan of Lego. <laughs> You yeah. can tell you everybody that you like Legos on this <laughs> website. Where can people follow you on social media? What have you? What do you have coming up? Well, I guess follow me on Facebook. I don't twit. I don't do any of that stuff. Um, but you can look up uh, Frank and Matt mm -hmm. uh, on Facebook. Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson is. Uh, we do monthly shows in Culver City. I think our next one is September. 17th or something like that. But Fanatic yeah. Salon. Fanatic Salon, mm -hmm. monthly. And, um, Occasionally. and then check out Lego City Adventures on Nickelodeon on Saturday morning. And anybody you want to say hi to at all? Like a wife who you're going to end up apologizing to when she sees us? Hi, Rebecca. Hi, Phoebe. Hi, Jack. My kids. They're the best. Yeah. My dogs, Charlie, Bobby. We have a praying mantis right now named Hermione. Matt, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Bye. We're running long tonight, so I want to thank you all for watching. This is a way to reach me on the socials. And, Maddie Craig, thank you so much for allowing me to interview you. It was an honor and a pleasure, and I hope I have you back on the show really soon. As for a couple of production weird things that happened, please just know this is a work in progress, and a couple of things are wonky. We're trying to de-wonk this, but we're still trying. And, um... Next week, we're probably going to take off because I haven't had a break since the 4th of July. So, probably in two weeks, we'll be back. Um, everybody, please have a safe and fun Labor Day. 
and from Hollywood. That's a wrap. All men's acapella group, and I got in that group as well. <laughs> and, um, okay, look, friend of yours? Just, no, I have no idea. But the guy's famous now. Okay, that's um, Doris. <laughs>